All right, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the third day of CISA's fourth annual Cybersecurity Summit. A uh, big thank you to Secretary Mayorkas for kicking off today's great discussion. Uh, throughout the next few hours, we're going to focus on a subject that I am very passionate about and a top priority of mine as the CISA director, and that is strengthening and enriching our nation's cybersecurity workforce. As we think about what Team Awesome really looks like, I think we need to do everything we can to ensure a cyber workforce that reflects America and who we are. And because we know it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do because diversity of gender and ethnicity and education and sexual orientation and neurodiversity, all of that translates into diversity of thought and enables better problem solving. And I learned a long time ago that it takes a lot of good thinking to solve the hardest problems. And certainly technology and cybersecurity present some of those really, really hard problems. And I know when your team is comprised of people with different backgrounds, uh, you get different perspective and the, the results are, of course, better. So I am so pleased and excited to be having this uh, conversation today. Uh, with the Chief Executive Officer of Girls Who Code. Uh, Dr. Tarika Barrett is joining me this afternoon. Uh, Girls Who Code is an international nonprofit organization working to close the gender gap in technology. It has served over 450,000 students to date. It's an amazing organization. I got a chance to work with Girls Who Code uh, in my last role at Morgan Stanley. And I was just so excited for us at CISA to be able to announce a partnership between Girls Who Code and CISA uh, last month with the goal of developing pathways for young women to pursue careers in cybersecurity and technology. So, Tarika, thanks so much for being with us. I couldn't be more thrilled about our partnership and collaboration. Uh, you know, we're both women and in tech, and I will share that it is a personal goal of mine to inspire more women and girls to pursue careers in cybersecurity and technology, uh, and your organization is just doing that. So can you can you tell us a little bit about the mission of Girls Who Code and maybe also how did you come to this uh, to this organization? Thank you so much, Director Easterly. It's such a pleasure. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about Girls Who Code and then I'll share a little bit more about myself. So we're an international nonprofit working to close a gender gap in entry level tech jobs by 2030. And we're leading this movement to inspire, educate, and equip young women with the computing skills they need to pursue 21st century opportunities. And you know, by addressing this growing gender gap in tech, we're empowering our young women to seek out the thriving, exciting careers of the future. The ones that are gonna actually offer them the improved quality of life and upward mobility that a career in tech can provide. And you, know, you ask about our vision and our mission. We imagine a world where our computer science classrooms are as diverse as our communities, a world where women in computing have a sisterhood to lean on, and a world where that sisterhood in turn will create real change for communities everywhere. And you know, Girls Who Code, gosh, in terms of my own journey, it's been over five years now with the organization, which is really, really amazing. And I'm so honored to have stepped into the CEO seat this past April. And interestingly enough, I didn't always know about the work, even though at one point in my career, I led the team that designed and launched New York City's first high school focused on software engineering. And, you know, Girls Who Code has been this amazing force within the tech sector. And, you know, I've always been passionate about issues of equity in education, in terms of gender and in terms of race. So when I had the chance to kind of consider the opportunity at Girls Who Code, I had to take it because it was this intersection of, you know, what I really, I was actually um, influenced by it because I went to an all girls high school and saw firsthand the transformative impact that all girls learning spaces can have. And I also kind of got bitten by the tech bug, right? Designing a school focused on software engineering, seeing how hard, frankly, it was to make that school open to any kid who wanted to. And so as I thought about what I would do next and this opportunity presented itself, I couldn't say no. And I'm so happy five plus years later to be leading this organization into its second decade. Amazing. Well, the organization is very lucky to have you. That's fantastic. You know, it's funny, you come to it from an all, girl, all girls high school. I think part of why I've been so inspired and passionate to try and get more women in the field of technology is I started out 
at West Point, we were just 9% women. So, so I didn't feel that sisterhood until um, I, you know, pretty much got a little bit later in my career. But I think it's so important to probably as, at a young age is to build that. So kind of oh, yeah. kind of amazing. I, that resonates. And when I have, as I've come to learn more and more about your own background and journey, I, you know, am in awe. When, when I read West Point, I was like, okay, you <laughs> have walked a particular path and have had a particular journey that I know would resonate for so many of our girls and young women, what you just talked about in terms of being, you know, who had a seat at the table, you know, being in talk about a tiny minority of your class. Um, I'm hoping this is the right time for a question for you. Yeah, but please. I was really, you know, I'd love for people to understand why it was important for CISA to partner with Girls Who Code. Yeah, so thanks so much for the question. And again, I'm, I'm just thrilled about the partnership. I mean, I really saw the power of it uh, when we brought Girls Who Code to Morgan Stanley. And it was probably the funnest part of my day to spend to spend time with them. I actually remember their whole project that they did. I still have pictures of it. And they're just, I mean, it, it was the funnest thing, right? Because you can actually see the light bulb going off. Exactly. And, and exactly. part of it is just that community of women. I mean, it's just amazing. I just, anyway, so I was so glad about it. But, you know, it's funny because uh, it's not a surprise to anybody <laughs> that cybersecurity is not the most diverse field. I think it's probably about 20%. Um, it is getting better. Uh, but you know what's kind of interesting? I don't think people are aware that actually it used to be a lot more diverse. There's actually many influential women who've been in the field of cybersecurity, information technology. Uh, I know you're very aware of Grace Hopper, uh, one of my personal Indeed. heroes. Uh, I think, you know, she was up at Vassar College. If you remember, she joined the Navy after um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, and she was really part of um, the first uh, computing. I think she invented COBOL, uh, which was really, really cool. So I love that. And then, of course, Ada Lovelace, who, who wrote the first ever algorithm for a machine in the mid-1800s. And then uh, Katherine Johnson, of course, who did NASA's trajectory analysis for the, for the U.S. Uh, first human space flight. So, you know, the list goes on. Um, but even, you know, regardless of the fact that we had a lot of women uh, in this field as the pioneers, uh, according to recent reports, I know there was one by the International Information uh, System Security Certification Consortium, which is really hard to say, uh, ISC squared. Uh, only 24% of the cybersecurity workforce is currently comprised of women. So, you know, without women pursuing careers in cybersecurity, in technology, I really think the industry is missing out on, you know, a huge talent pool, right? Over half the, the population, frankly. So, you know, as we collectively work to establish uh, security in cyberspace, and, you know, I think our nation's ability to attract and retain and promote women in the field is absolutely vital. And that's why I'm so super psyched um, about our partnership, because we together, um, the power of Girls Who Code, the power of what we're building here in CISA as the nation's cyber and infrastructure defense agency, we can come together to build that next generation of cyber talent where young women everywhere can see themselves in cyber, can see themselves in tech, can see themselves um, in us. So, you know, I think together we're going to uh, collaboratively help close that gender gap um, and bring more talented young women into the workforce to prepare our nation to really be able to defend ourselves against uh, some of the most serious threats there are. So, you know, that's that's why I am so passionate about this. That's why I'm so grateful for your leadership and your partnership. Um, but I'm really, I'm really interested because now I get to ask you questions. Um, so what do you think are the biggest barriers that we need to collectively break down in order to make some real dramatic changes uh, in the gender gap in cybersecurity and technology? What can we do over the next few years? Yeah, and, you know, Director Easterly, some of the things you shared, I mean, honestly, you should work for Girls Who Code. Don't tell me when I said that. No one watching. Repeat Next that. job. Because... <laughs> Because everything that you pointed to when you listed out, you know, Ada Lovelace, Grace Hopper, Katherine Johnson, 
we know the fundamental barriers that get in the way for our girls. Even when you talked about the statistics around who's in cyber, those literally mirror the percentages of women in tech. And especially when we talk about black and brown women, black and Latinx women only make up about 5% of the tech industry. So we know the barriers are there. And at Girls to Code, we try to encourage companies, right? Like we are busy building this incredible pipeline, but we know that the rubber meets the road when our young women get that first job, that first opportunity in tech, and that 50% of them leave by the age of 35. So we have to continue to encourage companies to look deeply at their own practices and interrogate what they may be doing to alienate young people, and especially young men and people of color, or what they're doing to prevent them from being hired in the first place. And every company is different. There's no magical blueprint for this type of process. But at the very least, we hope that companies have discussions about work culture, as well as academic credentialing, something that I've written about. What we're really asking is that people keep an open mind, like redefining what they see potentially as an appealing hiring candidate and assessing promotion practices that keep women and women of color out of leadership positions. I know that this kind of self-reflection remains difficult, but it can be the difference between an all-white male office and an office that more accurately reflects the world we're living in today. So when you ask you know, questions about what ha- what are these barriers? What has to change for us to move the needle? Especially when you think about something as important as cybersecurity. Any efforts that aim to tackle systemic racism and sexism, the root cause, frankly, of the lack of diversity, be it in cyber or tech writ large, will naturally be met with resistance. But it's important for us to persist because we all have so much to gain, right? You talked about this from a diverse tech industry. For sure. Yeah, you know, uh, I just want to pause on a word that you said, because I couldn't agree more. You know, it comes down to culture. I think it's the culture that you build. I talk a lot about this, but it's so important, right? You've got to build a culture of um, psychological safety where everybody feels included, right? Where people feel like they belong. Um, And that's so important. Uh, It's important for everybody, but I think in particular, um, and I think back about my West Point experience, you know, uh, that was, I I would not say that I ever felt a real sense of belonging um, there. And, you know, I think that comes down to good leadership and the culture that you build. And so, you know, I think, I think what we're doing can help to motivate and incentivize cultures that do uh, bring people together in a way that it really does reflect the best of our nation. So again, I'm just couldn't be more excited about this. You know, you mentioned um, some of your work on academic credentialing. I'm really interested um, in terms of how you think colleges, universities can get involved in supporting uh, Girls Who Code. Yeah, I love that question. And, you know, just to echo your excitement, I am beyond, you know, over the moon in terms of this partnership and what it can mean given, you know, the platform that you have and the work that we're currently doing. And we're so proud of our Girls Who Code college loops on campuses across the country. But, you know, colleges and universities should prioritize programming and initiatives that educate students about the importance of careers in cybersecurity, first and foremost, right? Because we're still, I remember when Girls Who Code, like early days, girls were like, what is coding? Right. We're still not so much today, but you have to remember that their kids are going to be like, what's cybersecurity? You know, like, what does that mean? Beyond that, they also create pathways for them to access companies looking to hire and connect them with mentors. It really is fundamentally this ecosystem that we're trying to think about because we're all kind of coming at this problem, those who are in this field from different angles, and how do we get that connective tissue in place, right, so that we can create that ecosystem for our young people. And, you know, we've been learning about this. In April, we launched our first ever work prep program, a two-week virtual program designed to introduce college-age women to career pathways in technology. And, you know, by all accounts, the work prep pilots were really successful. Over half the participants said they would continue pursuing their technical degree and go on to pursue a career in tech, which is exactly what we want. Yeah, amazing. And 
Totally. And the thing about the program that's important to underscore is that it was designed with an eye to all these challenges, you know, facing historically underrepresented groups in technology, and especially our women of color. You know, notably, this is the exact group who reported the most gains from our pilot program. Colleges and universities, will, they'll want to continue their efforts to provide these critical early exposure opportunities. Yeah, and is it so in terms of the the outreach to underrepresented communities, is there a direct sort of crossover with how you're reaching out to colleges and universities or is there another effort to get to these underrepresented communities? You know, we did something kind of cool recently. We did a um, a grant uh, actually to to look for unrealized cyber talent and unrepresented. It's amazing. Talent. So so we're trying to figure out how to um, you know, how to really ignite this, but I'd love to totally. love to know how you guys are thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at Girls Who Code, we do everything thinking about underrepresented girls in those communities. And for our organization, we're uniquely positioned to lead on expanding workforce participation because we're kind of already doing that work. As you shared, you know, so kindly in your introduction, we've served 450,000 girls and young women to date, half of whom are Black, Latinx, or come from low-income communities. Wow. So we're already doing that. And our programs, you know, I, we talked about the college space, but if I even think about our direct service programs that span from third grade all the way through college and now into the workforce, take particular care in delivering what we consider best in class engagement with our most marginalized students in mind. So I'll give you an example. During COVID, we designed offerings that contemplated the specific needs and circumstances of our students. And the result was really programs that were shorter in length, had both synchronous and asynchronous opportunities, featured group work, office hours, and you know myriad other supports. And I think we kind of have to think about our outreach and engagement with this in mind, knowing how difficult, frankly, these, you know, this moment is for so many of our young people. And for us, our North Star is gender parity and entry-level tech jobs by 2030, because we understand that closing the gender gap in tech is absolutely critical. And we know that the key to building this pipeline is reaching girls before middle school <laughs> through our clubs program, you know, which takes place primarily in the after-school space. And, you know, you said this so well when you talked about these, you know, female tech pioneers. We know that you can't be what you can't see. And our programming is designed to change the perception of what our programmer looks like and does by showing real world examples of women working in tech, women like you. And, you know, another reason why I'm so thrilled about the partnership, because I think we can really elevate and change the image of cybersecurity. I love it. I love it. Elevate is exactly the right word. That is that is awesome. Yeah, super excited about the partnership. So 2030, gender parity in technology by 2030. I love that. I love to have goals because you measure what happens. <laughs> it's so that, true. You, that is fabulous. Well, look, last question. You've been doing this for five years. Um, I bet you have some great stories of, um, you know, people that you have mentored or you've sort of seen to go on to careers or is there anything you you'd share just I mean everything that I've seen about girls who code is just so inspiring but I'm just yeah. wondering if like give us an idea of some of the things that that um with these 450,000 women <laughs> horrific. I mean, it really is yeah and you know listen there's there's so many stories that I could share with you and it's funny the timing of our conversation comes so Monday is you know International Day of the Girl, right? The girl. And I know it's a big deal. So we get to celebrate the power of young women and embrace that global sisterhood, right? And also kind of look ahead and remember that we can harness technology to create the future that we want and that girls and young women are going to be at the center of that. And when I think about that moment in your question, I can't help about, so we have this phenomenal video, just wait till you see it. It yeah. is so good. And it positions these incredible women, you know, in these, it, they're so glamorous and so amazing. And then you read their titles and you're blown away because each one of them is this formidable force to be reckoned with in tech. And they're using, you know, tech to not only change the world, but also we want it to give girls this bold message to also change their own futures, right? To kind of have the life and path that you want for you, for your family, 
that is not just about making change. It's not a binary that you either are in tech making a ton of money and not doing good, or you're, you know, in tech serving your community. We don't believe in that. We think you can actually do good and have a powerful pathway for yourself personally. And so I'll share the story. Karina Popovich is one of our alums who's featured, and I don't know if you've heard about her. She's at, she's a junior at Cornell now. And I, you know, I would follow anything that she's doing at any moment in time. But what blew my mind, and she's one of the young women featured in this video, she created Makers for COVID-19. And it was an initiative to 3D print PPE materials for medical professionals on the front lines of the fight, you know, against COVID-19. And together with this group that she convened, they created tens of thousands of units that they 3D printed of PPE for medical workers. She was in our program and left, you know, and was able to leverage and harness that sisterhood that she understood, understood the bravery, the resilience, that she would have a level of agency and empowerment to not only be this incredible technologist, right, but to use everything that she's doing for good. And we have so many stories like that. Students like um, Kaya Sumachayo, she's now at George Washington University studying computer science. Her mom was a refugee from Uganda. She's faced so many different things, and now she's on track to beat the odds and be one of the few women graduating with a degree in computer science. And for her, she's going to take that degree and address issues of inequity in education. Well, and because she wants to, that. listen, don't think I don't, I, I'm not already putting two and two together. And she is, you know, there are many people who, of course, want her to come to their company too, because we want more girls like Kayasu, like Karina, choosing you know, pathways or careers in tech. So thank you for asking me that. Yeah, <laughs> Such a great question. So amazing. So amazing. Well, look, um, I could not be more thrilled um, as we kick off this partnership and I join your team. You are incredible. Um, thank you for your leadership. Right back at you. Yep. No, thank, thank you, you for your for, leadership. <laughs> yeah, thank you for everything you're doing, Dr. Barrett. I really, really appreciate you joining me. This is such an important conversation. And, you know, I'm beyond impressed uh, with everything that you're leading and creating and just, you know, what you're doing to empower young women around the world, really, to pursue these careers in technology. And I am super excited about the outcome and I'm super driven for 2030. I, I think we can go beyond parity. Absolutely. I'm going like, to put the 35 or 55, whatever it is, Mark. On I the love 100%. it. Yeah. Um, but again, thanks so much for your time and really looking forward to being part of your team. Uh, thank you so much, Director Easterly. Truly a pleasure. And I am so inspired by the work you're doing. And we're so grateful to be in partnership with you. Awesome. Thank you, my friend. Have a great rest <laughs> of the day. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.